Happy Easter, everybody. It's nice to celebrate this great season, especially after a year of COVID. And I'm delighted that, 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 that Father Peter Jives has, has accepted our invitation to really guide us at this time to this series called An Easter Faith That Does Justice um, Outside the Walls. Um, it looks like Ireland's in the back of me now, certainly outside the walls. We had hoped to do this in the parking lot and online uh, in, in the post-Easter season. For most of us, as growing up, our faith is something that, that centered on Easter, and we were all well-versed with Lent. And Easter, for most of us, was a day, and we sometimes forget that we're an Easter people and that our faith calls us to go um, outside the doors, so to speak, into, in, into the world. Um, so we, we asked Father Jives, who's, whose life has done that in, in, in a magnificent, transformative way. He was, he was originally, well, he still is a doctor who, who spent some time down in El Salvador during the 1980s as, as a volunteer simply to spend time outside the walls, literally, and, and to work with the poor. And that was a, had a profound influence on his life. And he, but he ultimately became a Jesuit priest and, and he's the director of a faith that does justice. And um, in, the, in the biblical times, there was a, a tradition where the Ark of the Covenant, the tent, the temple was always the place of encounter with the divine and outside the walls where, where, the, where most of the, of the people were there was a sacred space that was, that was for prophets to speak to power. And it was um, a place where anyone could take that space to, to, to engage that conversation outside the wall. So, and so we've invited it's Father Jives for these three weeks to, to help us maybe unpack what our faith could be, um, the fullness of that faith that we've really just kind of scratched the surface on. Since most of us in this country, our experience of faith is, is usually confined to a parish or a church on a weekend. And that's really not its, its home or its, it, its root or its wings at all. And um, on this day, I, I'm happy to turn this over to Father Jives now who, could, who will steer us in, in new ways to kind of deepen that, that breadth of our faith experience and to really go beyond the walls to a, a world that is broken and in, in need of healing and certainly in, in need of faith. So, so welcome and thank you so much for accepting this, this invitation, Peter. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And thank you, Phil, also for your uh, ability to make this happen. Uh, I have been to uh, St. Susanna's a number of times. I thoroughly enjoy going out there. was disappointed to hear today that the weather would not permit in-person dialogue, but happy to be here uh, in this webinar and to really try and share a little bit of the Easter experience uh, with people uh, this afternoon. Uh, as Steve mentioned, he, he called me a week or two ago about this idea of doing something in the Easter season that would take us beyond the walls of the church and really talk about the Easter experience. And today we'll have a series of three talks. Today is the first one. And the idea today is really you know, the Easter journey to live as resurrection people. What does it mean to us today to really experience the resurrection and to live that? in our lives, in a society, quite frankly, that's in the midst of quite a bit of turmoil, where there is not oftentimes the, uh, the great love that we might see for all God's people. So I'd like to say this is an opening statement that if we are to live as resurrection people, we must know something of the encounter of the passion and death of Jesus. Why? because there is no glorious resurrection without the cross. And if we say that we must know something of the cross, then we must know something of Jesus's life. Why? Because Jesus was killed because of how he had lived. And that's really the, uh, the essence of what we're talking about today is to be disciples with Jesus, taking on his life, living his values in a society that doesn't always accept um, the, the values of the kingdom of God, a world where there is love for all God's people, where there is compassion at the sight of human suffering, and where there is a justice that reaches to the ends of the earth and affects all God's people. So with that, I'd like to start with a very brief story of my own encounter, perhaps with uh, resurrection people uh, that was transformative to my own life, and then really talk more theologically and then as I finish, if there are questions, I do my best to try and answer them. So the story in brief, um, 
I am a pediatric endocrinologist by training. And 30 years ago or so, I was a, a, a physician scientist at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And really uh, ending kind of a journey of almost 20 years of formation in the field of medicine between pre-med and med school and residency fellowship and five years at the National Institutes of Health. And during that fifth year, uh, I began to look at jobs uh, at children's hospitals, which is where my career would have taken me in an academic, uh, as an academic physician. And yet, as I began to think about this, what really struck me was that my life had been in many respects a very privileged one up to that point. I had been given a tremendous amount of nurturing. I had been given tremendous opportunities to do what I was doing. I had worked hard, but my life was now set, it seemed, to be very, very successful. Uh, and yet I was aware for whatever reason that two thirds of this world, the people who live on the underside of history, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized of this world, who live, work and die before their time uh, would never get the opportunities that I had. Uh, and for some reason, that bothered me. Ignacio A. Correa, who is a, was a Jesuit, in, who was the target of the assassination attempt in November of 1989 by the Salvadoran government against the Jesuit priests there. Six Jesuits were killed, including Ignacio A. Correa, and their two female working companions uh, that horrible uh, night of, uh, in November 1989. That only emboldened me more. I had made a decision to go to El Salvador. I had been in El Salvador prior to the murder of these Jesuits. I was not a Jesuit priest at the time. I was a so-called lay person. And I decided for sure that I would go down there. And I, I arrived in El Salvador a matter of weeks after the Jesuits were killed. The borders had been closed. There was no entry into the country. I was one of the first groups, if not the first group in the United States to get back into that country. And I would say my experience there towards the latter part of that civil war and the peace accords that followed it were transformative. And by that, what I mean is that I met what Ignacio A. Correa had called the crucified people of history, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, who make up the majority of this, of this world and really owe their crucified state to the way the world is organized and maintained by a much fewer number of people who exercise their influence over the majority of people in a various uh, number of ways, which Ignacio A. Correa said two things. One is it leaves these people in a historical hell, one that does not transcend history. We oftentimes think of hell as some place we might go to if we don't live a good life. Um, Ignacio A. Correa said there is a historical hell. There's one existing right now that is human made and that forces about two thirds of this world to live within it. And he said, quite frankly, he said, the mechanism by which this occurs and the way this is maintained in history has to be named for what it is. And it is sinful, basic sinful behavior that causes so many people to lack the ability to become who God wants them to be and to participate in a fair share of the goods of God's creation. And so, I spent three years at that time, a little more, uh, really working among the people, providing health care predominantly to people in conflicted zones where there was fighting and also in what they call marginal communities in the city of San Salvador, the capital city. Uh, people who had nothing, um, most were squatting on land. There was no potable water for many people, no electricity, really subhuman conditions for many, many people. And coming from a life of privilege, I had been given quite a bit. I, uh, I was very taken by this. The witness of the Salvadoran people to work for a life where they could experience dignity for themselves and their own children. And also the witness of these Jesuit priests who took on speaking truth to power, the Salvadoran government in defense of the people of that country for their basic human rights and human dignity. And they were killed for it. It reminded me very much of what I knew of the life of Jesus, and it really has led to a great interest in my own life on who is this historical Jesus who shows us the way to this Christ of faith. I recognize, too, that in these people, the crucified people of history that I lived among, people dying before their time because of inhuman conditions under which they lived, 
They also ironically are resurrection people. Hard to believe that people who are treated so poorly and death seems to hover over them so frequently that these people can live their lives with a sense of the spirit of resurrection, a spirit of the risen Christ's joy and peace for other people, a, a spirit of the risen Christ's love for all people that it would go out to the ends of the earth so that people might become a new sense of human beings in a new world order where there would be signs of the kingdom of God, love, compassion, and justice for all God's people. The experience was overwhelming. It took some time to process. But really, uh, the group that I run, A Faith That Does Justice, is really an attempt to, uh, to offer back something of that. And if I, as I've been at St. Susanna, as I've talked about this some, that we run these programs where we try to raise consciousness about uh, issues that affect vulnerable people and offer people like myself, perhaps like people watching today, opportunities to walk with people less fortunate than, than themselves by offering the gifts of their lives so that others might be able to partake of a fair share of the goods of God's creation. So that's a story in brief. And what I'd like to do now is really talk a little more theologically about what does this mean to us? Uh, you know, we're Christians in the 21st century in the United States. If you say to somebody, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm uh, uh, a Methodist, I'm a Episcopalian, no one's going to bother you in this country. There are parts of the world where that probably is true, but not in the United States. It is very easy to say, I am a Christian. But that has nothing to do with really what it means to act upon being a Christian. To act upon being a Christian is to identify with Jesus' life outside the walls of the church, as Steve has talked about, moving us beyond an intellectual ascent to faith, dogma. We believe in the dogma. We believe in the Trinity, three persons in one God. We believe Jesus is human and divine. Those things are very easy to say and to believe. But on the other hand, to live the values of Jesus' life will likely get you in trouble where there are people, the status quo, people who are living more in terms of self-interest than the common good of all, really will um, object to uh, opening this world up so that all people can participate and reach the, the fulfillment in life that God desires for them. So the way I'd like to do this is to really start at the beginning now not from the cross, but going back, and, or the resurrection, but going back to the life of Jesus. And first, we we'll talk about his life. The Christian tradition believes in the incarnation, that God in God's goodness desired to save this world. It was a world that had gone awry. And through the incarnation, we believe that Jesus was born into this world. And it is very important to take note of, well, where was he born? Jesus was born in first century Palestine, a land of oppression, of poor people who were being dominated by the Roman Empire, uh, brutally treated and, and, and uh, uh, taxed uh, without uh, people having the opportunity or the really the, uh, the well-being to be able to meet some of these taxes. Many people were brutally killed, uh, and Jesus is an example of that over time. What we know of Jesus' life, in summary, is that he grew up in Galilee, uh, Nazareth, and he began to preach this kingdom of God at about 30 years of age. And the kingdom of God was a world. He talked about new human beings in a new world order, where people would be treated fairly, where people would be treated with respect, they would be loved, they, there'd be compassion, and there would be justice, which there was not for most people in first century Jewish Palestine. And so with Jesus, he called disciples, called disciples to follow him. Initially, they did not really understand what he was doing, what he was about. They saw him as a temporal figure who would bring power, overthrow the Roman Empire, and bring peace within uh, the Jewish society of Israel. None of that happened. And yet over time with the resurrection, these people began to realize it was much different intent on Jesus's part. It was not about temporal power. It was about humble service on behalf of all God's people so that all people could be treated with the dignity they deserve. And so 
to follow Jesus in this world is really an opportunity for us to identify with the life he lived. And to, to identify with that life is really to take on not only his values, the values of the kingdom of God, love, compassion, justice, but also to place ourselves in situations, social situations that Jesus did. He placed himself in a land of oppression among oppressed people. And what we know of his life is that he spoke truth to power. He spoke out on behalf of people who were suffering. He offered signs of the kingdom of God. When he cured the deaf man, the blind man, the paralytic, the people who didn't have enough food that he provided food for. These were signs of what the kingdom of God would one day be like. He was offering hope to people that one day the kingdom will come in its fullness. And you who have been treated last, discarded by society, will be first in the kingdom of God. Not necessarily because they were better, but mainly because they were treated unjustly. And he told them they who were last would be first. On the other hand, many who were first would be last. And that line has always struck me in, in the gospel story because I consider myself to be someone who was one of the first, is one of the first, a life of some privilege. And yet, uh, what I found in my time in El Salvador is this concept that if we are first, who will be last in the kingdom of God? That is what we've been told. Is there any hope for us? If the first will be last, the last will be first, where do we stand? As someone of privilege who has been told, because you've been first, you've had your fill. You've been given the opportunities that most of this world does not have. What we have to do is step back and say, I have an obligation to use these gifts, to use the gifts of my life on behalf of people in need. And it is really through the concept of solidarity. When we can find a way to walk in solidarity with the suffering people of this world, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and offer the gifts of our lives to alleviate the suffering and to put ourselves in situations where they are so that we can take on some of their suffering and also, as Jesus did, speak truth to power. Then we are with them, walking with them, and that is our entree, I believe, into the kingdom of God one day. For people, it's different. Some people can do this very easily. They have no commitments. People are married. It's much harder. But for some people, this may be nothing more than really being able to take care of someone within your family. It may be a parent with Alzheimer's. It may be a child with a learning disability or a diagnosis of a chronic disease of cancer. Things like that, that we are called then to really accompany people who are suffering. For other people, it may be an opportunity within your church setting, for example, at St. Susanna's, to participate in something that the parish is doing together, to really walk with people who are struggling and to offer what we can to alleviate that suffering and where possible, to be able to speak out on their behalf. So those are some possible ways of, of looking at this. Now, the second thing I'd like to talk about is this idea that, uh, what does it mean to be a disciple? I think the sine qua non or the absolute requirement to be a disciple of Jesus is not religiosity. It's not the, the rites that go on, the sacraments that we do. It's really an ability to develop relationship with the God we believe in, to discern God's will. What is it that God is asking me? What is it that God is asking you to do with our lives, not just once or twice in our lives? There are big decisions people make in life. For example, uh, people get married, people enter religious life. Those are enormous decisions about a major thrust of someone's life. But decisions are made every day about what am I being asked today? How am I to live my life as a Christian, as someone who truly follows Jesus, living his love, his compassion, his sense of justice, having the courage to speak truth when we see injustice in society? That's what it means. And we are called to discern that truth and then to have the courage to act upon it. That is the sine qua non of discipleship, to discern God's will, to act upon it by following Jesus in the unfinished work of the kingdom of God. When we do that, we are authentic followers of Jesus. And that leads to this idea that 
uh, I learned this when I was in El Salvador, this idea of the religionist evasion. That's a fancy word, but really what it means is that many of the churches, the Christian churches, the challenge of really living Christianity by moving beyond the walls of a church to follow Jesus in society and to work for systemic justice on behalf of all God's people is a threat. It's a threat to many people in society. It's a threat to the institutional church. And as a result, oftentimes in history, the institutional church has backed away from the following of Jesus in the unfinished work of the kingdom of God, the risk involved in doing so, to take on a more sacramental approach or religious rights approach where church becomes the dominant feature. We go there, we we uh, experience the sacraments, we participate in the rituals, but there's very little emphasis placed on using the gifts of these sacraments to bring us beyond uh, the church uh, borders, the church boundaries, and into society to work for, for justice. So Ignacio E. Correa talked about this Christian praxis of, of living the values of Jesus in society. It gets reversed, and it turns into uh, an intellectual ascent or a sacramental taking on of some kind of an allegiance with Jesus. The sacraments are meant to help us to follow Jesus in this world. And Ea Correa used this phrase, he talked about action on behalf of God's justice is the true measure of any religion. Religions that talk about justice and are not doing anything are suspect, quite frankly. And the sacramental life of a Christian church is valid only to the extent that it leads to Christian practice. We can do all the sacraments we want if all it does is keep us in a bubble and does not allow us to engage society, the injustice of society, and to do something using the gifts of our life on behalf of, of justice. It really is an evasion of the true intent of Christian practice that Jesus talked about. He called followers to, to, to be with him in society. Uh, if you read the gospel stories, yes, Jesus is in the temple occasionally. Uh, he's in the synagogues occasionally. But most of those stories about Jesus in society, working on behalf of people in need and speaking out on their behalf. So that's something about where we start. God entered this world in a situation of tremendous injustice. God acted against it in the life of Jesus. And what we find then is what happened. What happened is human sinfulness arose and destroyed Jesus. There was an attempt to coalesce power against him because he was a threat to the status quo. He was a threat to the way society works. And what we find in his own, uh, exa own example of life is this idea that um, he did speak truth to power. And if we remember in John's gospel, uh, there is the story of Jesus going into the temple with a whip and throwing people out, casting over tables. That story, most theologians say, probably did occur. Many of the gospel stories we know today are not uh, newspaper accounts. They didn't necessarily happen exactly that way. The gospel stories are written as faith accounts. They're written to give us an idea of who this Jesus was, the power he had to really transform people's lives into goodness, into wholeness, as God would have it. And, and from that, to really discover something of this Christ of faith that we come to believe in as Christians. And so in the gospel stories, we hear these uh, events of Jesus's life over and over again, running into conflict with the, uh, the temple authorities, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, people who are working very hard to maintain the status quo of the temple. And why? Because the Jewish aristocracy of that time was profiting greatly from the temple practices. Uh, Jewish people would have to come in, they'd pay a temple tax to sacrifice animals for atonement of sins. Some of that money was going to the chief priests, Sadducees, Pharisees. There was a, a back channel of, uh, of funding of these people to allow them to live very well off the backs of very poor people. And this is what Jesus objected to, the hypocrisy and the legalism, the laws that had developed by the Pharisees from the time the Jews had come back from their Babylonian captivity in the sixth century, up until the time of Jesus, the laws kept increasing. The Pharisees had this very legalistic way of, uh, 
of practicing Judaism. And it was something that many people, because of the, the harshness of their lives, were not able to do. And, and as a result, were made to feel guilty, were made to feel as sinners, and were cast aside, quite frankly, by uh, the powers that be. Jesus objected to all of this. He was perceived by the powers that be uh, in the Jewish faith as, as threatening to them. And if you remember in the uh, uh, Holy Week, we read from John's Gospel, and Caiaphas at one point says, it's better that one man dies than that this temple go under. And what he's referring to is Jesus has a following. He, people, he's a charismatic person. People are following him. And uh, the Jewish authorities are afraid that uh, if he gets out of hand here, uh, there could be a riot within the temple and the Roman authorities would never have tolerated it. They would have come in, destroyed the temple, and they would have killed quite a number of people. And as we know, in the year 70, uh, 40 years or so after Jesus was killed, the temple was raised and the people were dispersed. So we, we hear in Jesus's life, someone who had a tremendous and profound relationship with God, and he acted upon it. He did God's will and it brought him into conflict with the powers of society who wanted to maintain a, a societal order that was basically unfair and kept so many people uh, really uh, suffering because of their inability to meet the standards that were put upon them by the, uh, the powerful of that society. So today, you know, we're called, discipleship is placing ourselves in those kinds of situations. And we do that as we live. We're not asked to do anything extraordinary. Uh, if you are married, raising two children, God is probably not calling you to go to Africa tomorrow. But what God is saying is that in your own life, there are situations that you're going to need and that we ask you to, to really to discern what it is God is asking of you and to follow it. Have the courage of conviction to take a step into the, a leap into the darkness and from there to live beyond church walls, not to deny in any way the dogma of the church or the value of the sacraments and the rituals that we practice. But if that's all it is, it is not what Jesus was preaching. Jesus preached a way of life that took us beyond the temple and into society to live on behalf using the gifts of our lives to help people in need. So we've talked a little bit about Jesus's life. We've talked about uh, his own situation where he comes into conflict with people and is killed as a result of it. In, in the Christian tradition, after Jesus died, shortly thereafter, there was an attempt to explain the horror of his crucifixion. Crucifixion in the Roman Empire was a horror. It was the most horrific death they could inflict upon somebody. And it was used as a deterrent uh, so that people would see the horror of someone crucified. Crucified people oftentimes lived several days on a cross before they would die. In Jesus's case, we're told he probably died within about three hours. And the reason for that is, is that he was brutally beaten. He was probably half dead by the time that they crucified him. So to die that quickly is an indication of the torture and the brutality with which he was treated before he was put to death on a cross. The, the Christian tradition took over a concept from the Jewish people of the suffering servant. The suffering servant comes from Isaiah in the sixth century BC, before the time of Jesus. And the Jewish people had just come back from Babylon and trying to restore their lives, their temple. And what we find there is Isaiah or a follower of Isaiah in the sixth century who's writing about them and saying that these people, the Jewish people, have suffered double for any sins they've committed. They've been horribly treated in Babylon. And now they're coming back. And he said what's really going on here is that these people, the Jewish people, have been chosen by God. They've been elected to really uh, to serve as a light to this world. And they use this image of the suffering servant as someone chosen by God, someone who is despised by the powerful of society, someone who will suffer, and someone who, from whom su their suffering will come uh, the idea of salvation, that they will take on the sins of other people, the Jewish people, and then be a light to the world so that other people might see that God is calling people to be new human beings in a new world order. The Christian tradition quickly caught on to this and said, Jesus is the fulfillment of this. 
The prophets talked about this. They used it to describe the people of Israel. But it is Jesus who has fulfilled it. That's the feeling that they have. And I, what I learned when I was in El Salvador, Ignacio E. Correa, he talked about these suffering people, the masses of people in El Salvador and other parts of the world, quite frankly, who lived without anything. Uh, lives that were really not uh, fit for, for uh, human, human consumption. I mean, uh, very difficult to really uh, to navigate day to day. Uh, and yet what you'd see is people who are of incredible quality really seeking a life that would bring them dignity for themselves and their children. Ignacio Iacuria talked about these people that it was, they are today offering us a reminder of who Jesus was. The unjust killing, the dying before their time of people because of a society that is full of sinfulness. Jesus was the one, the, uh, the ultimate form of the self-offering of life for the salvation of this world. Uh, Ea Correa does not deny that. But what he says is that the suffering people of this world today witness to this same idea that innocent people are being killed before their time through the injustice of human sinfulness that, that casts aside as much as two thirds of this world so that a small minority can live well beyond their means as others really struggle to, to live day to day. And it is through their figurative crucifixion, figurative death before their time, and in fact, the historical death before their time, that these people are really placed into a historical hell. It's one that is human made, that forces people to live under these conditions. We often think of hell, as I mentioned at the beginning, as something beyond history that bad people go to at some point if they have not lived good lives. And Ignacio Iacuria really asked us to think about this. He asked us to imagine this idea that as Christians, he, he asked the question, what have, what, uh, what uh, have we done? What are we doing? And what ought we to do to take the crucified people of history down from the crosses upon which they live today? And that's quite a challenge. It's a challenge for the churches. And as he says, that's part of the reason they back off into sacramentality and emphasis on sacramentality without much of an emphasis on action in society on behalf of the justice of God's uh, people. And so as Christians, you know, if we uh, have experienced Jesus's life by trying to take on his values, by living as he lived, by entering into uh, situations of conflict, speaking truth to power as best we can in the world in which we live, we will meet pushback. There are people who will not accept what we're doing. I'll offer a brief example that if you were to work in a soup kitchen, uh, you know, once a month or once every six months, I guarantee you that you'd have neighbors who would say, wow, he says, you know, that's really quite nice what you do. I really admire it. And I ought to do something like that myself to help people in need. Uh, and is that good? It is very good to do. But it's a demonstration of love and compassion for human suffering. It has nothing to do with justice. And I don't say that in any demeaning way, but basically the people who come into a soup kitchen today will come in next week because their condition hasn't changed. On the other hand, if you get involved by either lobbying for change in the way uh, people have to live because of poverty or perhaps immigration laws that really allow people to or force people to live in situations that are deplorable. I guarantee you there, there are some people who would say, I don't like what you're doing. You're, you're, you're mixing politics and religion. And I would say that that's not true. Jesus never preached a political, social, or economic revolution. But, but, but the kingdom of God has, has social implications. If we live as God wants us to live, there has to be changes in the way uh, some live at the expense of others. And I think that is one of the real challenges of Christianity. And quite frankly, it is a reason why at times the, the, the churches, Christian churches in general, have really backed off from, uh, from practicing the praxis of Christianity, of becoming involved. So those are two. We have the life, we have the death of Jesus. Historically, Jesus died because of the way he lived. And he lived, as I mentioned, 
working against human sinfulness and fostering life in its fullness wherever he could. God's desire that love will overcome evil and God's desire for life will overcome death. And that brings us then to the resurrection. I mentioned at the very beginning, we cannot experience the resurrection if we haven't experienced the cross. And the reason is there is no resurrection without the cross. It comes from suffering, from identifying with suffering, from walking in solidarity with those who are suffering that we can experience something of the risen Christ in this. And as I mentioned in my own experience in El Salvador, to see people uh, in a country uh, the size of Massachusetts, El Salvador, which at the time I was there might've had five to 7 million people. There were 70,000 deaths in 10 years. Virtually every poor person knew someone who had died, be it their mother, father, brother, sister, son or daughter. People all knew. People who had died had been disappeared, brutally beaten. And yet, when the end of the war came, what astounded me was many of the poor people, you would wonder, would there be a period of retribution where with peace, people would go after, uh, and with vengeance, the people who were responsible for so much of this killing, which would have been the Salvadoran government and their military, uh, death squads, which had done so much harm to so many people. And what I heard over and over again was the refrain, we have seen enough violence, we need peace and we need healing. And it was these people who had experienced so much suffering, uh, the crucified people of history, who now became resurrection people. These were people who knew what it meant to suffer, knew what it meant to figuratively die, have death thrown upon them because of the lifestyles they were forced to live through human sinfulness. And now in the end could say, we forgive you. You know, in our gospel reading, even today, if you uh, heard the mass, uh, we hear an appearance story. And in those appearance stories, we hear the same thing over and over again. There are three themes that play out. First, there is, a, there is Jesus appears uh, in his risen form. Today we hear he's gone through walls, that's not flesh and blood as we know. It's the risen Christ who has appeared to these people. They don't initially recognize who it is, but he tells them first, he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. It's really a form of forgiveness. These are people who had betrayed Jesus a week earlier, and he's now telling them, it's okay. What happened has happened. I want peace, I give you forgiveness. And then the second thing that will occur is there's a reassurance. I think it's in today's gospel, we even hear at one point, he asked for something to eat. That's a way of telling um, the followers of uh, John, I think we're reading, that uh, this Jesus is real. This risen Christ that they're seeing is the person they knew as Jesus of history, who they walked with uh, only weeks before. Uh, Jesus is with them in his glorified form. So we hear forgiveness through peace be with you. We hear reassurance that I am the person that you knew. And then finally, what we hear is missioning. There's a missioning to go out to the world and to bring the good news of God's love, God's joy, God's peace for all God's people to the ends of the earth. And that's what happened. If you think about it, these are people that Jesus is appearing to in today's gospel uh, in the upper room in Jerusalem. Upper room means it's a two-story building. These people are hiding out of fear for their own lives. His disciples who betrayed him. They're in hiding because they fear. They can be identified as Galileans in Jerusalem, therefore followers of Jesus and, and likely targets that if they kill Jesus, they may want to kill us. So they're there hiding. We know two of them left town to go to Emmaus. They were afraid. And now we hear Jesus giving them peace and sending them in mission to fulfill the unfinished work of the kingdom of God, what he had asked them to do they are now being missioned to do. And Catholic tradition at least would say that 10 of the remaining uh, 11 disciples uh, at the time of Jesus's resurrection uh, met violent deaths. The only one who lived that we think lived to be an older person was John, the gospel reading today, the beloved disciple. For some reason, he lived, he lived a natural death, whereas all the others supposedly uh, really died of, of violent deaths. But here are people who are hiding. This event of the risen Christ transforms their life. 
And I think that's the story for us today. How do we partake of the risen Christ? As I mentioned, I think one way is to participate in his passion and death some way in our own lives. And that happens through solidarity, through accompanying people who are in need, in our own way, offering the gifts of our life. We all have gifts. Some of them are more uh, educational. People have higher educations. The other people have talents in terms of being able to, uh, to do things with their hands, to put things together. Other people have personalities that are magnetic, that can really engage people and bring them in. We are all uh, gifted in some way, and we're all asked to use these gifts on behalf of the people who are suffering in this world. And with that comes our solidarity with human suffering. And in that, we will find in these people so often this idea that those who are suffering understand it, and they've had enough. The violence needs to end. We are being called to be new people in a new world order where there is love for all God's people, where there is compassion at the sight of human suffering, and where there is a justice that will reach to the ends of the earth and that we are the agents of this change, that we're being asked to bring this to people more through our actions than through our words so that people might see in ourselves the risen Christ and be able to transform their own lives. So with that, I think I've used my allotted time and I'm gonna stop here, but I want to, uh, there may be questions, but I thank everyone for the opportunity to really just uh, express this idea that the, we are capable of experiencing resurrection, not as the disciples in the privileged experience that they had 2000 years ago, but we can experience it through our own access to human suffering and then the ability to, to rise from it, to see the risen Christ's joy and peace and love for all God's people and for ourselves as well. So I'll stop with that, thanks. Thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone to uh, please use the Q&A uh, feature. Just float your cursor down the bottom. You'll see a little bar pop up and click on Q&A to submit your questions. If nothing comes up, if there's a question, just stop me. But I'll just say, too, that, you know, if you're looking for a way, how do you act as, as the risen Christ? I think within your own parish, you have a program there that uh, Steve coordinates in terms of raising consciousness. You have a speaker series. I know you have outreach. I believe last year, at least prior to COVID, you had a, uh, an immigrant family you were housing and taking care of. There are a lot of good things happening in your parish. Uh, you can certainly check in, I'm sure, and find ways to do that. And through our own program, A Faith That Does Justice, we do hold um, uh, conferences or talks where we try to raise consciousness. And we have action components where we try as a group to really uh, walk with the risen Christ to offer that to other people. So. We're still working with the uh, family. And um, it's it, we just do it with zoom <laughs> yeah yeah that's great work i mean that is the work of the kingdom of god of really trying to uh, to take people in need and and you know when i was in el salvador john sabrina who was a jesuit there uh, i mentioned this in the talk but just to, to paraphrase he said that you, you know this idea we've been told in the gospel stories that the first shall be last and the last shall be first and you know by fact of education myself included we are the first who will be last. We have had privileged lives by the fact of education. It's given us opportunities. It's opened doors for us that many, many people around this world will never have an opportunity to, to, to get. So how do we then, is there hope for us? And, and John Sabrina would talk, the key is solidarity, walking with these people in suffering so that we might take on some of their burden and that from that, we will see something of the risen Christ and be able to live out of that, this joy, this peace, this sense of love for all God's people. So. Have, have you noticed any difference with COVID um, relating to the way people traditionally volunteered their time? So for, for an example, uh, people might've gone to um, the Pine Street Inn 
or or other institutions like that and volunteer you you would mention that during your your talk where people would volunteer for you know a, a day out of the month or um or or that kind of thing i don't know if that's really continued in that manner is is that volunteerism changed from your yeah. observation yeah so that's an interesting point you raised ironically we have had an influx of a tremendous number of volunteers uh, because you know with zoom people can work from home so it's opened a door to a lot of people who might be confined to their home it might be someone you're know, raising small children who can't necessarily come out to a meeting in the evening, but during the week, uh, they can offer us time and uh, we've had great help with that. We've run an ESOL program uh, for English for speakers of other languages, and we've developed a, uh, a whole host of uh, volunteers who will assist these people. We, we've developed this idea of coordinators who will call, if someone misses a class, we have someone now who will call them in their language and really uh, find out you know, what's going on. Why can't you uh, dial in uh, in Zoom to our conference and try to help them get through whatever's going on. So it's been, it's been a boom, quite frankly. Awesome. We do have a few questions in at this point. Uh, one from Bill and Kathy Hubert. <clears throat> we see the suffering of the people in Central Latin America continuing at our Southern border. Can you speak more about their continuing suffering and how we can walk with them? Yeah, another great question. You know, uh, for this reason, we're holding a community meeting. It's April 27th on Zoom. Uh, you can uh, certainly, uh, if, you, if you're not on our mailing list, I'll just mention this one time and maybe Steve, if anyone asks, you could make sure they have it. Our webpage is uh, www.faith-justice.org. Uh, on that homepage, you can sign up with your email address and name and We'll uh, put you on a, a mailing list with no obligations on your part that would let you know about these and you can register for these meetings. But I think what we're up to here is we're well aware that the uh, current administration, uh, presidential administration, is going to try to uh, congressionally or legally try to pass a bunch of laws that will change the way the border is working now. Uh, admittedly, it's a disaster. I think everyone would say that on both sides of the aisle. And... Uh, we have some excellent speakers who are well-versed in what's going on politically as well as socially. And we will hope to uh, raise consciousness about what that is and hopefully offer some opportunities to people who might have an interest in getting more involved. And you know, the value of Zoom, you can do a lot from your home, which is really a, a, a real uh, plus for many people. Thank you very much. Um, this from uh, Bill and Eileen Gorman. What do you think about Joe Biden's plan to send money, I don't remember the exact amount, to El Salvador and other Central American countries to help them recover from the destruction caused by recent hurricanes and create venues for employment? Yeah, well, I mean, having lived in um, Central America, mostly El Salvador, but also Guatemala, uh, Central America is the poorest area of the Americas. It's poorer than South America, poorer than Mexico, poorer than our country and Canada for sure. Uh, the, 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 the way this, the, there's no jobs, there's no nothing. It's really incredibly poor. So, uh, you know, in theory, uh, going to the heart of the issue and doing something to help people in their own state of life will no doubt prevent a lot of the rush to the border that we're seeing now. So I think there's wisdom in that. Now, the politics of that, I don't know. I mean, I think this is what's all going to play out and what we hope to, uh, to learn a little bit about on April 27th for anyone interested. But it's a, you know, it is an interesting idea of, of not just trying to deal with people as they arrive, but trying to go to the root and, and see if you can uh, stop some of the flow by creating a situation where there's more of a life there. There's no hope. There is no life in, in these countries with employment. There's no future for many people, no education for many. Uh, thank you. And uh, this one from Tim Sullivan. You mentioned in some of these words, I hope I don't um, uh, mispronounce them. I'm unfamiliar with them. You mentioned praxy, and it reminds me of an idea I ran across that orthodoxy leads to orthocardia, which leads to orthopraxy. Orthodoxy was never meant to be the goal. 
Yeah, I think if I can uh, hopefully get the gist of what's going on. There's a contrast between in the church between orthodoxy and orthopraxis. Orthodoxy means correct doctrine. That, for example, we believe in the Trinity. We believe Jesus is human and divine. We believe in the incarnation. That's orthodoxy. That's doctrine that as a Christian, we believe in the risen Christ. You can't be a Christian if you don't believe that. But orthopraxis is right uh, practice, right? The practice of Christianity, the action component. And I think what you'll find in, um, certainly in some of the Latin American churches, this idea that we need to move, not to deny orthodoxy doctrine, but to move beyond that. As Steve has, this whole idea of the talk is to move beyond the church walls, not to deny anything going on within them, but the action of Christianity takes place to a great extent beyond the church walls in caring for humanity. So I, I think that's what he's driving at. And if I understand it correctly, I agree. You know, we need to move from orthopraxis to ortho, orthodoxy to orthopraxis, from right doctrine to right action on behalf of humanity. Yeah, orthodoxy leads to, or, and what is orthocardia, just for my information? Orthodoxy leads to orthocardia, which leads to orthopraxy. Well, I can only Practice. guess it's right, it, having the right heart, I guess, you know, being compassionate. You know, and I think that's true. If that's what he means, you know, it's from compassion. Compassion is the linchpin that moves us from an experience of God's love to fulfillment in acts of justice. I think it's compassion. We hear all the time in the gospel stories, Jesus had compassion on the blind man, the deaf man, the crippled man. And it's from that compassion that he acted. But it was a deep sense of compassion. And I'll just mention biblical compassion is not intellectual. It's not a sense of in your head that, oh, I feel really bad for these people. I hope they'll be okay. And I don't mean that demeaning, but something going on in your head. It's more something in your gut that you're almost sick to your stomach at what you see. The way human beings have to live because of human sinfulness. And there comes deep within you a sense of, I cannot accept this. And I will act as a result of it. That's the compassion that Jesus had that led him to act. Thank you. Uh, this is from another attendee. Can you speak more about opportunities to get involved and try to alleviate the suffering of people crossing the border while also taking care of family and job responsibilities? Yeah, well, I think that that's the reality. I tried to mention that, you know, when, when I speak like this, some people would get the idea, well, everyone should drop what they're doing and go to Latin America tomorrow. That's not, that's not what we're being asked to do. I think discernment of God's will is in the ordinary. God doesn't ask us in the extraordinary. If you're married with a family, raising children, God is not asking you to move out of that. God is asking you to work within that. And that limits to some extent. I mean, our myself being a Jesuit priest, not married, without family, my ability to go to Latin America tomorrow is 100 times greater than somebody who's married with two young children. That's not what God is asking us. God is saying, you know, where are you in life? And can you listen to the stirrings within your heart as to what you're being asked to do? And that may mean nothing more than the care of a child who has special needs, a parent who is sick. Uh, it may mean getting involved more at your church. Uh, uh, and Steve would speak more to that about what goes on at St. Susanna's. For ourselves, you mentioned immigration. Uh, this person who's asking, I would really invite you, please come to this meeting April 27th. And um, you, know, you can get uh, from Steve, I believe, our web page. And all you have to do is go to the home page and give us your email address and name. And we'll get you the information you need. And I, the hope there is that we will all learn something about what's actually going on right now. I think the Biden administration is going to try to pass some legislation. And obviously, it becomes a political battlefield. How much of it will, will, will get through? I don't know the answer to that. But I think April 27th, we may get some insight as to how this is all going to shape, shape up and, and fall out. So. Thank you. Um, that's, the, that's the last question that we have at this point. Oh, and uh, wait, I have one other one came in on chat. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll just relay it here. Uh, it is very difficult to speak truth to power regarding resistance to militarism, which harassed the nuclear buildup. 
the heavy footprint on the climate when the church fails to cut its ties to political parties and does little to address Christian participation in war. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's what I'm talking about, you know, and, and the concept that I certainly learned in, uh, in Latin America and uh, not to say it can't be learned anywhere else, but this idea of the uh, religionist evasion, you know, I mean, uh, I think what the person asking the question is really saying is that the church is too silent. I think that that would be a true statement. The church has backed off from confrontation. And, you know, the answer always is money. You know, in the end, it comes down to money. Uh, there are uh, wealthy people funding lots of programs. And uh, I think the church, institutionally speaking, becomes very gun shy of really speaking truth to power in whatever form. You know, we have many. Militarism is one. We have Black Lives Matter. We have Asian violence. We have women in church and society. We have the LGBTQ community. This society in which we live has got many, many issues that need uh, truth being spoken to power. And I think, while in fairness, there are, we have some bishops who do speak well, we have too many who are silent. And, and my personal editorial is maybe they're not completely silent. They seem to get very loud when it's a single issue like abortion. And they tend to align themselves on that issue and make their voice very well heard. But somehow when other issues like the groups you just mentioned, Black Lives Matter, Asians, all sorts of things, they're remarkably silent. It's just very interesting. They're, they're very loud on certain issues. Yeah, I would just say to that, you know, without getting too deep into it, that I've always been struck by the comment of uh, it was Cardinal Bernadine who talked about the seamless garment that, you know, as a Christian, an honest Christian, you cannot choose one. You can't say I'm for abortion, but, uh, or against abortion, but I'm for the death penalty. The seamless garment respects life in all its forms. And I think to be authentic as a Christian, we must respect all forms of life. That's what we're being called to do, in my judgment, at least. Uh, we have a question from Jeff Goodale. Are there any books on Christian praxis that you could recommend? Well, I think, uh, you, you know, the one that, there are many books, obviously. I think one that came out of Latin America is a book by Dean Brackley on um, I can, I can send uh, the title of it to Steve and anyone who wants it, maybe you could diffuse that to people somehow. But it's really a, maybe a more pastoral take on some of what I said today. Uh, but it would, it's kind of an e easy read in the sense of, uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, theological jargon. I try to, to kind of explain some different things. But it's, it's a good book on really looking at the call. Uh, he uses it, uh, the call of discernment in troubled times. That we live in troubled times right now. And the idea is to discern what is God asking of us, given our own state of life, married, single, uh, religious life. It's all different for different people, but God's asking something of everybody. Uh, and I think we need to, you know, relationship with God is about listening to that. You know, how do you, and in my third uh, of three talks on Sundays, I'm going to talk about the uh, examine of consciousness, this idea of how do we, can we plug in on a daily basis to the idea of discerning God's will? And I think the answer is yes. So it's more about that in two weeks. So you'll get that title over to Father Steve and he can I will. get it to Jeff. I'll do it right after we finish. I'll get right. to the... Uh, Thank you so much. And the last one was more of a comment. Thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Okay, well, I look forward to next week. I'm going to pray for good weather, and I'll ask Steve to ensure it, and hopefully we'll be outdoors and, uh, and enjoying uh, uh, somewhat, you know, distance, all of that. But it'd be nice to be out there and to see everyone. So thank, thank you so very, thank you. very much, Father Peter. Thank you. Steve, do you have any closing words? Thank you so much, Peter. We look forward to next week, and it will, it will always be online either way, but hopefully we can gather outside as well. And if anybody would like information on a faith that does justice, it's really a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful ministry, which really tries to address a lot of what we're talking about here today and gives a lot of different venues and different opportunities to really get into some good con concrete action on, on a number of topics. So it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great uh, organization to, to, to engage and to, and to be transformed by. Faith-justice.org. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you next week, I hope. Okay. Thanks, everyone.